Come on, let's go outside. Let's take a walk in the sun. There are things to learn and things to see. A big wide world for you, your dog, and me. Dog Talk. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Dog Talk. I'm Pat Becker, and my guest this morning is Dr. Brian Jones. How are you? Good. How are you? And you are from Wood Lake yes. Animal Clinic. Yes. Uh, folks, I think you'll remember Dr. Jones having been on our program so many times before giving us tips. Well, we're going to start that again because it's interesting, it's educational, and I always learn something new. So how are you? I'm good. How are you? Welcome back, for goodness Thank sakes. Thank you for having me. Yeah, well, we consider you kind of part of the family. Oh, okay. So uh, you, you are an excellent veterinarian, and I understand that people who are breeding their dogs are very fortunate in that you are kind of an expert in facilitating a breeding. Yeah, we have to be careful with the word expert <laughs> because they, uh, a true expert is a theriogenologist, and that is someone that has dedicated themselves to, to the area of reproductive medicine and, and animals. Yeah, you know, and we, we did a, a little uh, segment with uh, OSU yes. with a, yeah, a person who does that. That's where they're at. Yeah. That, is, that is it. But you are a facilitator for this. Yes. We, we are kind of a jack of all trades. We do a little bit of everything, but we do um, a lot of, um, I guess, reproductive type things. Mm -hmm. um, we are so affiliated with um, a company called Once Frozen, which is actually there at our uh, at our clinic in Oklahoma City that stores canine semen. Mm -hmm. so. And so if, it, if it's a, a stud that comes from Europe, mm -hmm. you know they send the semen in and uh, you store it and yeah. uh, use the breeding. Yeah. And I have so many friends who are, have confirmation dogs who show yeah. them AKC and they go no place else but your place because oh, they feel so confident about it. Good. So today actually we're going to talk about uh, dysplasia. Would you like to do that? Yes. Okay, <laughs> let's do it. I, th I brought my zebra doodle up here, <laughs> and uh, I, we're going to kind of use him. So obviously, dysplasia doesn't happen in the front, huh? No, but it's all about the back end, unfortunately. Yes. Um, and hip dysplasia is, is kind of a really, really big subject. But um, in the realm of, of dog breeding and that sort of thing, it's, it's kind of like we want to know, is this dog later in life going to get hip dysplasia? Ah. And so, granted, if a dog is, you know, six, seven years old, comes in, is very lame in the back end with a lot of muscle wasting, then and hip dysplasia is suspected, at that point there's really only a couple of options for them. Lots of pain, lots of medis pain medicine and surgery. But if we can get something really, really early in life to tell people, hey, this dog is going to have hip dysplasia or, or it is going to have hip dysplasia, so let's do something early on. What about DNA? So there's, there's DNA, um, but the, there's not a good DNA blood test or a DNA cheek swab to tell us that a dog is going to have hip dysplasia. Ah, but the, the breeds, you can kind of tell from, the, there are some breeds that are more predisposed to correct, it, aren't they? Correct, correct. And so then that's where kind of the hip testing um, um, x-rays kind of come into play, because hip dysplasia is so multifactorial. It's, it, it is, there is a genetic basis, but there's also an environmental basis to it. Meaning, right. Give me an example. So if a dog that presents to me at one year of age, skinny, healthy dog with obvious signs of lameness in their back end, and we diagnose them with hip dysplasia, then that was obviously part of genetics. Uh -huh. That was mom and dad's fault. Uh -huh. But if this dog comes into me at seven and is overweight, inactive, diabetic. Big thing here, overweight, yeah. inactive, yeah. guys. That's a biggie. And then we look at their hips. Can we really blame the parents for that? Probably not. That dog probably lived probably its life Probably the owner over. parents. <laughs> yeah, yeah, unfortunately, that's, that's the case. And dogs that I would assume that are, are involved in sports and that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, high energy, high work, especially if, again, if they're high energy, high work, and overweight, then... Mm -hmm. then so what is this little apparatus that you brought so in? So there are two types of um, hip tests that are done um, here at Woodlake that we do a couple. Um, one is called OFA. OFA is Orthopedic Foundation for Animals, and they will certify preliminary hips at one, but they don't get their true certification until they're two years of age. Mm -hmm. That uses what they call a standard hip extended view. Can I, can I play with the... Absolutely. The here? zebra doodle the will zebra not doodle. bite. Okay. So a standard is done kind of with the dog in this position, but then the legs, and I can't crank on his legs. I don't want to break oh, him. Oh, he would, he would be... <laughs> He'd be uncomfortable. But it's done when I take the legs and I pull them straight out this way. Ooh. And what that does is it kind of lines the hips up and the, and the legs up, and we line the knees up as well to kind of get what does that hip look like at one point in time. Oh. And that is an OFA. So at two years of life, they can have that done. They have to be two to be certified. 
and it is a snapshot of what the picture of the, the hips look like. And then you send it out to OFA. OFA distributes it amongst three board certified radiologists, mm -hmm. and then they give you their opinion. Wow, that's excellent. So they'll either grade them as excellent, good, or fair, or then fail. And if they fail, then it's a mild, moderate or severe hip dysplasia. And, and this too, you know, with, with animals, uh, four-legged animals, <laughs> eventually something is like this is going to happen. And yeah. it gets a lot of them. I know that there are so many uh, options for dysplasia, but when it comes that time, putting, putting a dog, euthanizing them kindly, you know, uh, is, is a good thing. But if we could prevent it, yeah. you know, because a dog is healthy, otherwise organs good, you know, all of this, and it would be fine, but climbing stairs or getting in cars, you know, so it's a, it's a shame, guys. What we need to do is work on prevention. Well, and that's the, the big difference between the OFA and then this guy here, which is a pin hit method. Yeah. This is more of a predictor, so it can be done earlier in life. Oh. So like four months of age, we can do a pin hip, and what this does is instead of having the dog like this, it puts the dog more in a natural position, uh -huh. and then we use our, it's a, it looks like a thigh master. Yeah. It goes in between their legs, uh -huh. and then as this sits in between their legs on their hips, we squeeze. Yeah. It measures how loose the hips are. Okay. And how loose the hips are is a good indicator as to later in life if they're going to develop hip dysplasia. So do you do that with a lot of dogs that are geared for sports? Geared for sports, geared for show, geared for breeding. Oh, yep. Breeding especially. Oh, yep. see, that's, an, that's another one. We appreciate that so much. And I have one more issue uh, that I'd like to discuss with you. Guys, come in here. <laughs> I, these are my friends, D. Miles, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. And Ken Neely, how are you, sir? Doing great. Doing this is great. Dr. Jones. And Dr. Jones, these are pooper scoopers. Do these guys do us a great favor by going out and, and checking, picking up all the dog stuff. I have eight dogs. It really is a blessing to have these people. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me something, because I really wanted to discuss, and, and you guys have been in business for how long now? Uh, six months now. Six months. Well, you're on, a, on good stead. And, and uh, I watched you picking up this, the, today at my place, and excellent job, excellent job. Thank you. And so we're looking forward to it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use you. I, this will be great. I'm, you're hired. <laughs> Thank you. Thank so you. tell me, Dr. Jones, and one of the reasons that I brought the guys on is they see the poop. Mm -hmm. And like it or not, it's a nasty subject, but it needs to be discussed. It's true. Loose stools, how can you, you know, these people come in and say, Pat, you've got some loose stools out here. You better check with your vet. That is a blessing. But what about if, if a dog is constipated? It would be really hard, mm -hmm. so that's also a reason, you know, to check. So if once a pooper scooper person realizes that there's something amiss here that doesn't look like a soft, regular stool, you know, then it's, it's good to be told about this because people normally don't see it. Most people don't pick it up. Well, they don't. I mean, they come into the vet uh, clinic so often and I'm it's like, well, what do their stools look like? I don't know. They're, you know, I live on an acre and they just go in the backyard and I don't know what, but if someone could turn around and tell you, yeah, you need to check Fluffy out because Fluffy's got some problems back here. You're too loose, too hard, too chalky, yeah. too slimy, greasy. Right. I mean, so no, what, that's gross. what could, if, if they're too loose, there's what, something intestinal that's going wrong? Yeah, you know, it could be very simple as just dietary indiscretion, something that we ate that we shouldn't have. Um, could be stress, but then it could be a sign of, you know, some severe illness. So, yeah, so what about um, constipation? Uh, they've digested something they can't. Get they rid can't of? pass. Yep. Uh -huh. Yeah. So that could look, be really bad. Yeah. If it, if it really, if it's in the backyard and they're picking it up, then it's going to be kind of like chalk. Oh. Uh, I mean, it'll be very brittle. It'll be very flaky. It'll. It's really kind of gross. These things are good to know. Yeah. And then, of course, if they're really constipated and. I'm not sure how often we're, we're scooping, but if we're scooping every day and all of a sudden there's nothing there, then it's like, uh-oh, yeah. why is there nothing so there? So that could be a blockage of some kind, Correct. could yeah. be something like that. Yeah. Well, that is so interesting and I appreciate it so much. We're Anytime. looking forward to seeing you now and yeah. getting your tips and everything. Sure. This has just been great. Guys, I wish you luck. Hey, thank and, you. And yours is called um, Dog's, you, poop. Dog's Poop, We, we scoop. scoop. All right, so where can we reach you? Other people. Now, you're, you're going to be working for me, but obviously you can work for other people. <laughs> They can reach us at www.dpwsokc.com or at 888-418-9222. You've got it. Just let's pick up that poop. And, and, and it is important, isn't it, Doctor? Oh, very important. Very, very important. important. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to see some Scotties and some Westies.
K1 Pet Emporium is Oklahoma's authority on healthy nutrition for dogs and cats. Quality does not have to cost more, and we only have the best. If your pet suffers from allergies, digestive issues, skin infections, or hair loss, it may be the result of their diet. A1 Pet Emporium can help. We offer pet portraits monthly, adorable rescue animals every Saturday from noon to four, and free dog and cat food samples. Locally owned and operated, we want to be your neighborhood pet store. I was taking a walk with me sister Mary. Mom always made me take her with me. We came to a spot and were amazed to see a group of people with their little Scotties. It was plain they were going to a gathering somewhere. Me sister and me just stood there and stared. Those Scotties, the breed of which Mary is fond, were black and brindle and light sassy blonde. Mary always wanted to have one of her own, just Mary and Scotty, to play all alone. Well, they passed us by, and we sat for a while. Little Mary was sad, not Mary a smile. Then out of the woods trotted a terrier, a little black Scotty who couldn't look merrier. She had escaped from the crowd and was lost in the wood. We had to find her group. If only we could. So we grabbed her lead and we raced toward the sound of the pipers, the people, and the Scotties gathered round. And just as we found them, they were marching away. I went straight home, but Mary decided to stay. So who will you choose, Mary, when you go out to play? Someone to share your adventures all day? Well, what about a dog who's loyal and true, handsome and happy, dependable too? Well, there's no doubt a great choice would be a precious, precocious little Scotty. Well, was that a darling little episode about Scotties? They are so precious. And this little girl who was showing them, <laughs> it just moves my heart. It really does. And of course, this, this is a, a wonderful breed, Scotties, Westies. And we'd like to uh, welcome Kelly and Shannon and Megan and Betsy. And thank you so much for bringing your dogs in. You are from the Westie Rescue. You are also, uh, I guess, West Rescue uh, Karen Terriers and uh, Scotties? Yes. And yeah. uh, Westies, and so, you know, it's, it's so interesting to me. This breed of dog is so wonderful. The Scotties a little more reserved. Uh, the Westies very outgoing. But they all were bred, really, to, to hunt, to hunt vermin. Uh, they actually uh, would hunt badgers, and that's a pretty big deal. So these little dogs, now, do you get a lot of them in rescue? We actually do. Um, uh, many of them come from local shelters, um, but we also take in owner surrenders. Um, sometimes the family is unable to care for a pet anymore, mm -hmm. or perhaps they have medical issues that are, you know, um, prohibitive. That does so happen. We, so we take them in and rehabilitate them and, and find them good homes. Yeah, and that's that's the important thing. But it, it always amazes me how this these particular breeds could wind up in shelters mm -hmm. because they are so dedicated to their owners. They get so close. Mm -hmm. uh, the Scotties a little bit um, off with um, strangers and what have you, but that's what they were bred to do also. They were also bred to, to guard the facilities. Uh, Westies are so game for everything. And uh, we might note too that this Scotty over here who is light colored <laughs> used to be, they used to abandon those because they preferred the dark, the, you know, the black Scotties. And these that were born with lighter colors were then discarded. Thankfully, they became very popular as pets because they used to give them to some of the villagers, you know, and, and spay them or neuter them so they wouldn't reproduce, and the villagers fell in love with them. And this one loves to talk. <laughs> I just love that. You can see you can see how outgoing this Westie is. Yes, it oh, wants, yes. To, wants to do something great. Do you want to do something great? Oh, good kisses, Aww. good kisses. I love that. <laughs> well, we appreciate so much you guys bringing them on, and the Westie Rescue 
coffee has always been one of our favorites. And we do have a $500 donation oh. to, to give to you all. Thank you so much. And, and uh, we hope that you will keep us uh, you. In, you know, informed about what's going on Absolutely. and update us on it. And uh, do definitely come back with some Scotties uh, that are up for adoption. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, you. thank you, girls. Thank you so we appreciate much. it. Love your shirt. <laughs> we'll be right back. One Pet Emporium is Oklahoma's authority on healthy nutrition for dogs and cats. Quality does not have to cost more, and we only have the best. If your pet suffers from allergies, digestive issues, skin infections, or hair loss, it may be the result of their diet. A1 Pet Emporium can help. We offer pet portraits monthly, adorable rescue animals every Saturday from noon to four, and free dog and cat food samples. Locally owned and operated, we want to be your neighborhood pet store. All right, welcome back, and we've brought back Dr. Gary Marr. Yes. By popular demand, we had some messages, emails that get that guy back on. We want to hear more about his business and what he's doing, and you're going to introduce us to your family here. Yes, this is my dog, Kibo, and my wife, Pat. Awesome, awesome, and uh, for those that don't know, Dr. Marr is a chiropractor, once for humans, now for dogs. That's you might correct. work on my arm here in a little bit because I got a little bit of that golf swing problem going. Um, what do most of the people that come into your uh, clinic, what, what, do, what do their dogs usually have issues with? I don't, I don't know that there's, there's a common area or complaint, but most of them are uh, some type of performance dog or agility, obedience, uh, and they each have their own series of sequelae from doing those type of, of things. And, and what it, is, it, is it like a human? What can you do for a, a dog that's having some issues, whether it's arthritis or something like that? Is it, is it similar to, to a person? Yes, yeah, very similar. Everything that we do is human technique that's been adapted to animals. So from that respect, it's not any different. Um, they also have a spine and a nervous system just like we do, and that, as chiropractors, is what we deal with. So whether it's a human spine or an animal spine, there are a lot of similarities. What, what does uh, your dog have some issues with? You said that it was a little bit older of a dog, 30 13 years old. What, what, what does she deal with? Uh, she's getting a little bit of a little bit ataxic in the back end, a little bit of wobbly in the back end. But I think she's having some um, some issues right at the end of the from the last rib back, basically. Okay, and um, you know, I, I grew up with a golden retriever, and one of the big problems that she had towards the end of her life was hip dysplasia. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of one of the things you get? Does that fall under your umbrella? No, not really. If it's a true dysplasia where there's a malformation uh, of either the, the socket that the hip goes into or the head of the femur, uh, there's nothing that we can do with that. Mm -hmm. Now, they will get some compensations in other areas due to that, and those are some things that we could possibly work with. Okay, all right. And um, Let's, let's say that uh, I'm having issues with my dog walking. Maybe uh, because my dog's a little bit older, having problems walking, what can I do um, in terms of a chiropractic sense to help my dog do longer on walks? Is there any way to, to establish endurance or anything like that? Uh, just, and, and again, it's no different from a human. I would start, start small and work up, but basically we just want to make sure that everything's functioning and working properly in their spine to allow them to be able to do that. Like rest and relaxation? Uh, that's important afterwards, yeah. I mean, if they, uh, if they have some arthritic changes, perhaps, um, depending on what the extent is, we may or may not be able to do anything with that. But we just want to make sure that their spine and pelvis is functioning the way God intended it to do. Sure. 
sure. And if someone is having some issues with, with their personal dog, how can they get a hold of you? Where can they find you? Uh, I live between Norman and Purcell in Lexington, and uh, that's we're kind of out in the country, so we're not uh, hard to get a hold of, but, <laughs> but we're, we're out in the country but, a little bit. But you're around. You can we're find around. him. And if you have any questions, please message us um, on our Facebook page, and uh, we'll get a hold of Dr. You Marr and, and bring him back again. Uh, we'll be right back. Food. You know, I just couldn't stop thinking about it. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, I went to the fridge and I opened up the meat drawer. You know what the meat drawer is, right? Yeah. What was in there? Well, I'll tell you what was in there. You know that bacon that's like maple? It's got maple flavor. The maple kind, yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah. I took that out and I thought, yeah. I know who would like that. Me. So I ate it. Oh, no. You kidding me? Nope. Not kidding. You know, I also noticed there was some beef in there. Yeah, you know, steak, you know, juicy. Well, I ate that too. <laughs> but I went back to the fridge just a few minutes ago and I put something together really special. You're going to love this one. I took some chicken. Yeah. I put some, yeah, I yeah. put some cheese on it and I covered it with covered it with what I covered it with cat treats yeah. then guess what what i gave it to the cat ah! janelle hendrix is with us today janelle welcome thank you now you have this wonderful um, um, ability to do nose work <laughs> Explain nose work to me. Well, nose work is a, a new sport that engages the dog's nose to hunt for, in the basic uh, starting classes, we hunt for food. Mm -hmm. And um, that just teaches them the game and that it's fun. And then later on, we can change them over and teach them specific odors to search for. It is a wonderful sport. And it, I, I really love it because anyone can do this sport, uh, an older person, a younger person. And your training is so explicit that each of these dogs gets so much out of it, and I really love it. We did a video with you uh, a little ways back, and I um, thought we would run that. Would you like to see it again? I would. It's, it's great. It's great. It explains everything. Watch this. Come on, Barney. Everybody who owns a dog is aware of the exceptional abilities of our canine companions. These abilities have sustained them for centuries to live in our world. They have acute hearing, excellent sight, but their greatest asset is their sense of smell. Scenting is an important factor for prey drive, for finding food, for looking for things that may be lost to them. And today we're going to talk about the use of their noses. It's called nose work. We've invited Janelle Hendricks with us today to explain all about it. Barney, are you ready for that? Yes, you're a good boy. Let's do it. Come on, Barn. So Janelle, I have come to you today to find out all about nose work. And nose work is scenting, is it not? It is. Okay, so when you teach a dog to, to scent along the lines that they are searching for something specific, is there a certain breed that does better? No, I think uh, just uh, any dog, any breed, um, just if they enjoy using their nose. Uh -huh. So the, you're saying that uh, Labradors are as good as poodles or little palms or anything like that? They can all do it. Definitely. What fun is that? And does it take a certain amount of effort? Does a person have to exert energy to do it? No, it's not really a lot of effort on, on the person's do uh, behalf. Um, they do have to learn how to read their dog. So I think for both uh, the dog, it is a mental exercise and a little bit for the handler because they do have to really pay attention and see what their dog is telling them. So they alert to a certain item or, or fragrance or odor in what? You start off with the uh, containers? Yeah, which at the beginning would be boxes. What is all involved in that? Well, in teaching nose work to dogs, we start out in the foundation work by hiding their favorite thing, whether it be food or a toy. And we, use, we hide it in a box and mix it up kind of like a shell game with boxes to help control the environment and help them know what to search for that at the start. You were talking about, uh, at one time, uh, suitcases, that sort of thing, satchels, backpacks. Those come in later after you, uh, for competition. 
purpose, uh -huh. really. Um, and you, if you would add an odor, teach the dog to sniff out a specific odor now versus just their favorite food, um, you add an odor to it and then for competition purposes. Ah, I see. And then you do interior work at all? Yes. You do. You would pick a, an interior room um, in, in, a, in a building, depending on where you were practicing, and you would put a hideout or maybe multiple hides, depending on what you were trying to train that day, uh -huh. and let the dog search that just that room. Uh huh. So then you do. So you do interiors. Do you do exteriors? Yes. A, an exterior search is really any exterior area. Um, for competition, they will you know limit it to a certain you know, different size depending on where you're searching, whether it's a grassy area or somewhere up near a building, but it's really any outside uh -huh. area. So they do boxes and then they do suitcases and satchels and they do interior and exterior and what else do they do? And the last thing is vehicles. Uh, vehicles? Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. So what are they searching for when they search a vehicle? Well, on vehicles, once they're on odor, there, it's like a little tin with a magnet that you hide on the car, uh -huh. and um, that's what they're searching for is that specific odor that you've already taught them with the other right. elements. This has been so interesting, and, and we appreciate so much your, uh, your filling us in because uh, Barney thinks that he might like to try that. Can a beagle do that? Oh, definitely. He would be great at it. <laughs> <laughs> Barney, you think he'd like that? I think he would too. By golly, we might try. All right. Folks, this is a wonderful sport. I highly recommend it for everyone. Give it a try. Now, Janelle, if we want to give it a try, how do we get in touch with you? You can uh, call me. on My phone number is 405-428-8226, or you can email me at sniffthisnosework at gmail.com. There you go. Folks, you need to try this. I guarantee you, you'll like it. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next week. Talking about dogs, talking about big dogs, uh-huh, talking about little dogs, oh yeah, chasing the ball, chasing the cat, digging hole, thing like that, dogs, talking about dogs, laughing dogs, sad dogs, happy dogs, mad dogs, dogs, just talking about dogs. Lost and alone, running the street, checking the garbage, looking to eat. Out there sad and on their own, the law will get them if they got no home. Dogs, talk about dogs. Dogs, we're talking about dogs. You say they were angels sent from above, and a year or two later you fell out of love. You dumped them, man, and kicked them out. Now what the heck was that about? Dogs. Oh, we're talking about dogs, dogs, them poor little dogs, talking about big dogs, uh-huh, talking about a little dog, oh yeah, chasing the ball, chasing the cat, digging the hole, things like that, dogs, we're talking about dogs, laughing dogs, sad dogs.